championship mindset. It's a championship uh, mindset. Champion mindset. mindset. So a championship mindset. Being some sort of famous, it's so weird. I think I am kind of famous, but it's weird to say that because to me, I'm just me. The things that I go through are probably very similar to the things that a lot of people go through, whether it's, you know, performance anxiety in a game or performance anxiety because you have to deliver a pitch at work. Being an athlete in this time, Simone Biles talking about her mental health on the world stage, I think was so helpful for all of us. Um, Kevin Love, Naomi Osaka, like, I feel like we're at a point now where the stigma about mental health is lessening, but it's lessening with the gaps and access still there. Almost all the therapists are white, um, it's very expensive, uh, most of them I would imagine were cisgendered, um, and it is about access, it's about meeting people where they are. For me it's like this gentle, constant practice of giving yourself grace and being kind to yourself. It's all connected. You can't separate your mind from your body, from your heart ever. Megan Rapino, the two-time World Cup champion and gold medalist with that powerful message about mindset and really a perfect way to set up our discussion on mental health. And we welcome you into our roundtable right now here on We Need to Talk. And Aaron Taylor, thank you so much for staying with us and being part of our roundtable discussion. And what I want to bring out up to start things off is we have been hearing so many of these stories in college sports, specifically on the women's side, about these deaths by suicide, hearing it in entertainment as well. Uh, for all of you, but I'll start with, with Aaron, I, is it a trigger? I mean, I know it's affecting me uh, deeper than I ever thought because it's one after another. How is it impacting or triggering you, Aaron? Well, it's all around us. Mm -hmm. And I've been in the world of recovery for two plus decades, and it's actually the people outside of recovery in my circles that are struggling. Most of us are ill-equipped to be able to deal with life on life's terms. We suck it up, we wear our game face, we push through, but it's a cumulative problem that can have detrimental effects and consequences if we don't treat it. So that's what I'm saying is people are ill-equipped and it's either you're unwilling or unable to do something to improve your mental health. And for the vast majority, the majority of us, it's that we're unable because we don't have the tools. And that's one of the things I'm hoping that we can change. Yeah, and it's interesting. So when you say tools, I am thinking about it. And I, the one thing that stuck out with me with Megan and what she was talking about is that it is hard to get an appointment. And I, I talk about dermatology and melanoma. That one's hard. But to get a therapy appointment's real tough. And it is ridiculously expensive. And sometimes it's hard to navigate the insurance so people kind of give up. I mean, we, we don't have the tools. But what I've loved about this process of understanding mental health is how groups like NCAA teams are coming together and making it a priority to have open, honest conversations, to get vulnerable. That in and of itself is a tool. I mean, I have gone to therapy. It's not that much different. You are opening up to someone. You are giving of themselves, and there is this unloading. So I would love for people to understand maybe that they can do a little bit of this within themselves if they can't find a way to get therapy. Would you agree, Aaron? There's no question. The power of the shared experience is transformational. That's what recovery is based on. Basically, what we're doing there is getting what's on the inside on the outside. Feelings are not facts. Fear mm. is a liar. So the things that we go through oftentimes are basically our feelings are our body's response to chemical processes that take place in our brain. So talk therapy is helpful. But in the last three decades, we've made some incredible advancements in neuroplasticity and neuroscience and understanding how the brain works, that there are things that we can do to intervene, to lessen the severity so that we can basically pull the car over off to the side of the road, catch our breaths mm -hmm. and see that there's even exits that we can get off of this rat race and this fast moving uh, uh, beltway, if you will, of depression and anxiety and fear and all of the emotions that have come up after this three year and still running uh, period of uncertainty that we've gone through. So it goes beyond just talk therapy. There literally are some blocking and tackling fundamentals of healthy mind and brain health. And those are the sorts of things that we not need to start to teach in our schools so that we can equip people mm -hmm. adequately. 
You guys think the athletes are getting enough of this, though, and I'm t- whether it's a college level or the pro level? Because we see how with Naomi Osaka, is that, is that helping tennis? Is she getting the help? Like, what, is, what do you know, Kat, that she has done to help herself move forward? Is there a solution that's, that's helping her cope? I think everybody's different, and yeah. it's about talking it through and understanding what are the triggers. What is it that is really pressuring yourself? You know, we talked earlier with Dr. Rosa. Early, there's no age that's too early. And I think about being that athlete and training and wanting to win and being the perfectionist in whatever your sport is. I was an individual sport, so it was all on me. I couldn't pass the ball off, right? I couldn't throw it to someone else. And so I I think about those pressures that, you know, I had sports psychology at a a teenage year. Um, I don't, I think I just kind of blew it off, didn't understand the importance of it. Not that I was needed the mental help, but we all do, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but, but, I, but I think also, too, it, you know, you talk about therapy. There's socioeconomic backgrounds that just can't afford the therapy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and can't go out and get that kind of help. And so what are we doing in our schools, in our high schools, you know, on those young, teams? Young Let's start ages. there with these, with these athletes that carries on into the college and having the support that Aaron was, had mentioned. It's sort of you like know, the pulling over on the side of the road. And right. that, like, just knowing how to calm yourself down is such an important thing to say. Sorry, Aditi. No, no problem. I think one of the things that both you and Aaron were talking about in is setting an example, in being open and not feeling any shame and saying this is a part of treating the whole athlete, not just in schools. Who sets the example? Look at professional teams. And there are some professional teams, like the Baltimore Ravens, who have a full-time in-house psychologist who is available every single day in the facility. Not every team has that. Are, are a lot of teams on the have field too. Like if something happens in game, or is it just? Talk about being put on the spot. I don't, yeah. but actually when you think about this in general, a performance coach or just even, why don't we, and I, I'm sorry, I may be cribbing this from you actually, Summer, but athletes are very regularly expected to go meet with their trainer. They're expected to have an MRI if necessary. They're expected to test this, you know, like if you've got a sore hamstring, Mm -hmm. you need to show off your hamstring before you get on the field. Why can't it be necessary that once a week you have the check-in that Aaron just told us he does with his kids every Sunday? Mm -hmm. Why can't that be a part of the process? Well, I think it can, and I think it's just a culture change. We've seen other culture changes. You know, NBA players didn't come straight off the court at halftime and have to do an interview. That was something I remember when I was working for the NBA. It was like, no, they're never going to do it. Mm -hmm. Now it's just what we do. But I think the positive, really, Aditi, is the fact that we're seeing it in the NCAA teams. Mm -hmm. And the more we talk about it and share with people, NCAA teams, are getting together and they're having these very vulnerable talks and that just opens you up to go oh you're not perfect either oh you're not perfect either I mean I love talking about all the things you do right but it's kind of nice to talk about a few of the things you yes. do wrong yeah ah, so I can just breathe a little right. bit because more. it's that feeling of not being alone and when you're not younger, being an isolated experience and you're experiencing that younger such as the UNC baseball players that were so open about emotional mm-hmm. heavy moments in their lives and we were talking about the assistance dog yes then they'll take that through to the pros or to their professional and personal lives. Exactly. So start with that. Erin, you're awesome. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, Erin. Appreciate it. Our College Football Hall of Famer, by the way. <laughs> so if you or anyone you know is struggling and needs help, please reach out to the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Call 800-273-8255 for 24-7 free confidential support or text the word SAVE to 741741 and you'll get text support.